and uh, uh, he will uh, give us some lectures about uh, the introduction of the work of the topics. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, okay. So, uh, the goal today for me is uh, essentially I was planning to talk about some of our recent results in the Valve Commander Calculus, but then I I needed I needed to introduce it first. But the, the but I know that the audience is very broad, so instead I will try to just brief in a sense, just briefly impress upon you the calculus, because it's almost impossible to develop it in a full, full extent in the four, four hours that I have. So the goal will be to just somehow give you an impression of how the calculus works. I'll, I'll be purposely very vague in the formulas. So I will omit constants, I will uh, throw away the two pies that appear. Uh, the goal, again, is just to give you just a broad impression of how the calculus works. And hopefully, I will do this thing today and tomorrow during the first lecture. So this will be the, the first three hours. And in the last 15 minutes of the last lecture, probably I will talk about the results. Because the problem, I mean the problem, it's not a problem. The trick is that the, the calculus is very tedious. It has a lot of moving parts inside. And uh, if I just present the result, there won't mean anything to you. So, uh, OK. So the, the OK, so my plan, my plan is the following. So first of all, I'll just briefly talk about uh, pseudo differential operators in general. Or I'll right away immediately introduce my shorthand for that. I'll call them side views, or, or just pseudos, because it's easier. So uh, I'll talk about the quantization procedures. So this and quantization. Uh, in general, how they work. Then I'll talk about something about the uh, frequently used symbolic calculi. So uh, we'll talk about what that means. So I'll talk about frequently used symbolic calculi. Then, hopefully, not hopefully, but today, I'll, I'll talk about the Balfour-Mander calculus and how it generalizes everything else. So the goal, the, the idea, is that this thing, whatever it is, will generalize everything else. And in particular, for me, for today, the important thing will be to at least give you impression why and how these operators are continuous on S, on the Schwarz space. So why, in a certain sense, why these are continuous on S, on M, and S prime, and uh, also about the composition. Hopefully, I will uh, do this today. Tomorrow, in the first lecture, I will talk about the symbolic spaces. which are associated to this Weyl-Thurmander calculus. And hopefully about thread form operators. Because then the goal is to give some of the, at the very last lecture, to give some of, the, of our results about the thread form properties of uh, elliptic operators. So, uh, 
uh, this is my plan. Uh, before I start, please feel free to stop me and ask me whatever you like. I'll try to answer your questions the best I can. Okay, so uh, aha, uh, later uh, during the break or if somebody is interested, I can give him references uh, about where one can read about these things. Uh, again, everything to, up to this point is already known and all theory done by Hormander mostly the Hormander, and then uh, by a group of uh, French mathematicians, Bonny, Lerner, Chamin, which I'll frequently cite them because I will use their notation instead of Hormander's, because for me it's easier. Uh, okay. <coughs> so, uh, to start, first of all, uh, uh, this will be uh, Probably, uh, probably very easy for all of you, and probably all of you know, but just recall it. So, if I have a, a partial differential operator uh, with, uh, with variable coefficients, uh, when I say variable coefficients, I mean these are functions which are smooth, and the derivatives, the functions and the derivatives. Uh, have moderate growth. That means they are polynomially bounded. Uh, the trick is that the action of this operator on, on S, of this operator, of course, it's easy to, to show that it acts continuously from SRN into SRN. Uh, this is trivial. But the thing is that you can rewrite the, the operator by the Fourier transform like this. And this is the starting point about the quantization. You can rewrite it. Uh, I'll tell you what this is P of X psi in a minute. Uh, where this P of X psi is called the symbol of the partial differential operator. This is the symbol. Uh, and this thing is obtained simply by substituting psi in the place of the derivatives. So whenever I have a derivative of with respect, I mean, of course, it with respect to x, I don't have to write this. Whenever I have uh, alpha derivatives, I just substitute in that uh, place psi to the power alpha. So it's a polynomial in psi. This thing is just the symbol of this. And now, uh, this formula is obvious simply because of the Fourier transform, right? It's trivial. And the idea is that people very quickly realize that you can put something else here and the whole theory will still work. It doesn't have to be a polynomial xi. If it is a polynomial xi, then it's a differential operator. But the trick is that I can put something else there and still obtain a, 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 an operator. And when this thing is not a polynomial in xi, xi, then it's called a pseudo-differential operator. And the problem, I mean problem, the trick is what do you have to impose? So what do I have to impose on this symbol so that the resulting operator will be continuous on S? So again, the trick is what do you have to impose on this? So this thing will be continuous on S. And uh, the idea is that depends, uh, I mean, first of all, it depends uh, uh, where your operator you want, where your operator, where, where do you want your operator to be continuous on? So if you want uh, the operator to be continuous from S into S prime, so from the test space into the distribution space, then you can put anything. So any temporal distribution, when I say anything, I mean any temporal distribution will do the job. It doesn't matter. So if you have any A which is in S prime of two dimensions now, because it has X and Xi, then uh, you can generate this operator a x v this operator now from uh, and this will continue from s r n into s prime r n and uh, you can generate it like this by uh, by interpreting this thing in a weak sense. So the idea is uh, let me re rewrite this thing uh, again. Uh, 
I will just write the Fourier transform here as an integral. And you, if you write it like this, you can see the kernel of the operator. When I say the kernel, I mean the Schwarz kernel of the operator. So this uh, immediately you can recognize the kernel from this. So the kernel will be the uh, will be the integral. Okay, let me write the kernel here. So the kernel will be the integral of e to the power i x minus y psi a of x psi big psi. This will be the kernel. The, when I say the kernel, I mean the Schwarz kernel. Uh, of the operator, I will put a zero here for a other purposes, uh, purposes later on, because now I can define my a of x dim in the following way. So this this is now a map from s to s prime. So when it acts on phi, can, because I want I want this thing to be a temporary distribution, uh, we bracket it inside, and this is exactly this kernel. Uh, acting on uh, psi times phi. So the psi is with, with x and this is with y. And uh, this kernel, as it is written here, makes no sense, right? Because if this is a temporary distribution, this is meaningless. But you, you can really quickly recognize that this is the inverse Fourier transform of the second variable. And then you introduce a change of variables uh, x minus y. This thing will be the inverse Fourier transform of uh, your a, but uh, with respect to the second variable. And psi goes to x minus y. Uh, and you can always do this because the, 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 uh, the Fourier transform with respect to the second variable is an isomorphism on S. You can always do this, and the whole thing makes sense. Okay, and uh, then you can quickly see that this is indeed a continuous operator as a mapping from S into S prime. And the reason for this is uh, this is just a consequence of the Schwarz kernel theorem, right? Because the Schwarz kernel theorem tells you that. Uh, the, the, the operators which are continuous from S into S prime are generated by temperate distributions of the two variables exactly in this way. You have a kernel, and then you get on on the tensor product. This is, I mean, this is nothing special there. What I read there, read, read, what I wrote, wrote there, is just a Schwarz kernel theorem, but instead with, with this kernel, which is the inverse Fourier transform of la la la. Okay, so. Uh, so the trick is that if you want the, uh, your, uh, I will just give them, an, I will give them the proper name now. These are called pseudo differential operators. Uh, if you want your pseudo differential operator to be continuous from S into S prime, then you can put anything, and there's there's no theory. I mean, no theory. The theory basically is the Schwarz kernel theorem, and that's it. Uh, the thing is, uh, when this when this operator, when this pseudo. Uh, it's a continuous, it's a mapping from S into S. So when the, uh, the target space, you can shrink to S. And then you have to impose conditions on the A. And now, before I, before I give you <coughs> conditions on the A, which will generate continuous operators, let me introduce one more notation. This procedure, when you associate uh, I denote by L the space of linear operators from S into S prime, 
this procedure, when you, when you associate it to a uh, uh, temperate distribution, oh, sorry, I apologize, to a temperate distribution into, uh, in S prime, you associated this pseudo differential operator, it's called quantization, uh, and I wrote it like AXD there. And uh, this is called a quant this is quantization. And the schwarz kernel theorem tells you that this map is uh, isomorphism. Because for every S prime, you have an operator. And the schwarz kernel theorem gives, tells you that for every operator here, so you have, a, you have an arbitrary operator here, it is given by a kernel. It has to be given by a kernel, because there's the schwarz kernel theorem. And then you want to identify your starting A from this. And to identify the starting A, you do the, the, the other way around, right? So first you, you change variable, and then you do, take the, the Fourier transform and identify your, your symbol. And the, when you do the whole thing, you end up with this. This is isomorphism. Sorry? Okay. Now uh, there is uh, one more notation that instead of taking this kind of quotization where you take the Fourier transform, then you multiply with your symbol and then you take the inverse Fourier transform with respect to psi. Because the, the, the thing that I did here was the following, again. So I take the Fourier transform of phi, I multiply with my symbol, and take the inverse Fourier transform. Instead of that kind of procedure for quantization, one can introduce other types of quantizations. Uh, these are called usually tau quantizations. And this will be important for me, because the, there is a very really special quantization here, when tau is equal one half. Uh, I will introduce the formula now. So the tau quantization is, instead of doing that, I will introduce my, and I will define it, I will denote it like this, because this is the usual notation for this. The operator, the tau quantization of the symbol, so this is my symbol, and it belongs to S prime, R to N. So this operator, uh, let me write it as an integral, then I'll write, write you the kernel. On phi is well, let me not make a mistake here. If you take your tau to be equal to zero, you get exactly this. Uh, just to see it. So if, if tau is equal to zero, then uh, you take first the. Okay, so if tau is equal to zero, this thing boils down to x psi. So it's free of y. You can take it outside. And then when you take the integral with respect to y, this is exactly the Fourier transform of phi, because you have the e to the power minus i y psi, phi of y, and this is exactly the Fourier transform of phi. So you get this part. Right? Uh, and this is usually called, when tau is equal to zero, this is the standard quantization, and usually it's called the left quantization. Uh, there's also one more interesting quantization. Uh, I'll come back to tau equal to one half because that this will be special. There's one more interesting quantization and when tau is equal to one, I have to mention this. This is called the right quantization. And it has the very interesting property 
is that it is the transpose of the left quantization. So in this sense, so if I start with, a, I'll take a very particular type of symbol. So if I start with a symbol a of x xi to be of, of uh, this form, a of x times, times xi to the power alpha, if I take my ordinary left quantization, the operator a of x d with tau equal to zero is nothing else but a of x d alpha, right? When you take this is what tau equal to one. Uh, zero, sorry. When you take tau equal to one, what you get is you first you multiply with a of x and then you take the derivative. So it becomes exactly the transpose. I, I don't bother you with the, you can just plug into the formula and convince yourself. So you just, it just switches the things. So the tau equal to one, first, first you, you, you do the other way around. First you do the multiplication and then you do, uh, take the derivative. Okay. This is called the right quantization. Uh, so, uh, so for me, OP1 of A, the, the operator which corresponds to tau equal to 1, is d alpha A of x. And probably there is a minus here, but I'm not sure <laughs> about this minus. Because the transpose will have an extra minus, so probably there is a minus. So it will be minus d alpha A of x. Okay. Uh, now to go back to tau equal to one half, this is interesting, and this is called the veil quantization, and this will be interesting, especially for us, because I will only work for the veil quantization from now on. Because it has a very, very good properties. Tau equal to one half. Let me spell it out the whole sh the whole thing. Uh, this is the operator <coughs> with one half a on phi will be e to the power i x minus y times psi a of x plus y over two psi phi y dy dx psi. And this is called the veil quantization. And it's usually denoted, and I will use these notations from now on, it's usually denoted by A that's then W for real. Uh, sorry? Uh, I, have, I have a missing constant. Yeah, probably I have a missing constant. Uh -huh. Yeah, of course, I have the one over two pi. Yeah. I will be very cavalier with the constants. You told me. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so what's the point about the veil quantization? So it has a very nice properties. The first property is very easy to describe. And that's the fact that the veil quantization uh, is always self unjoined when the symbol is serial valued. Formally self unjoined. Uh, just to, uh, to clarify what I mean formally self unjoined operator, so this is in general, an operator A from S into S prime. Uh -huh, recall, uh, everything here is for A belonging to S prime. I have no restrictions on the A. So this is like totally general. An operator from A S into S prime is called formally self conjoined mm -hmm. Formally self conjoined If this thing holds, I will first write it, then I'll comment it. where this curly bracket is the sesquilinear form which is induced by the inner product from L2. So this is basically the inner product, but this pairing now is not in L2, but it's in an SS prime pairing. So now the SS prime, you introduce the pairing from the inner product. So it's basically as a uh, complex conjugate. So this pairing here means by definition, so this is the definition of it, means this. So this is your ordinary L2 product. And the trick is that the uh, while quantization 
is always formally self-conjoined when the symbol is real valued. That's the important thing about it. That's the first thing. And this follows from this uh, simple observation, which I will now write it down, is that the Sorry. Mm -hmm. Is uh, that uh, in general the uh, tau quantization of A? If I take the formal adjoint of the operator, which should stand here, so for this thing to, to be equality. The formal adjoint of A is exactly, with the tau quantization, is exactly uh, 1 minus tau here, and then for the other 1 minus tau, and then, oh, sorry, 1 minus tau, and then you have the complex conjugate of A, of the symbol. So it's the, uh, the tau becomes 1 minus tau, and the A has a complex conjugate. And if you have to take tau to be 1 half, what you get is that the, the formal adjoint of the real quantization is exactly the real quantization of the complex conjugate of A. And you can say, you can see immediately now, right, that the operator is formally self-enjoined if and only if A is a real valued. And this is the one important property of the real quantization. And the second one, which is far more important, is that it plays very good with the symplectic structure of the phase space. And now I have to talk about that thing a little bit. So, just very briefly, on your phase space R to N, this is Rn times Rn, uh, there is a canonical bilinear form which is skew symmetric and uh, non degenerate, and this is called the symplectic form, and it is given like this. I, I will denote it like this will be my standard notation for the symplectic form, and it is a uh, bilinear form on R to N and it's Q-symmetric and non-degenerate and it's given like this I purpose, uh, for those of you who you are familiar with the symplectic form, I purposely choose this one, not the other one because sometimes in the literature, it, the other way around, is, the symplectic form is defined, but I purposely choose this one for some uh, future thing that will prob probably arrive to at the very end. Okay, so, uh, uh, aha, okay, so, uh, let, let me, uh, yeah, I was talking about, uh, so what's important for me is that if you have, if you have a, uh, high uh, symplectic map on Rn. I will tell you what a symplectic map is. Uh, so high, not Rn, but R of 2n. Uh, symplectic. I will tell you what a symplectic map is. Uh -huh. This is called the symplectic, the symplectic form. because it is canonically generated. Uh, you don't have to do it by inner products. You can do it canonically on arbitrary vector space of finite dimension without even introducing inner product on the, on the vector space. Uh, okay, so if you have a symplectic map, so for me, that means that uh, it, uh, it doesn't change the symplectic form. So for me, this means that high of, aha, let, let, me, uh, let me write one more abbreviation. So from now on, I will denote by capital letters, so x, y, 
capital Z, the points in R to N. So the map is called symplectic. If the symplectic form is unchanged. And the trick about the veil quantization is that if I have any symbol A, uh, and I take a symplectic map, hi, symplectic, then I can consider this thing. A composed with high, where here the composition is in the sense of Schwarz distributions. So this means you right, you do the transpose of it to compose the symbol and then you pull it back. I don't want to introduce notations for pullbacks here, but and then you take the value composition of this. Then the resulting thing is always the value quantization of A, but uh, you have always this, the, the real quantization of A is always sandwiched in between uh, a unitary operator of an L2 and it's adjoint. And this U is a unitary operator. So, a uh, unitary operator on L2, you know, which, which keeps the the standard in the product of on U, on L2, and U star is the adjoint. And because it's unitary, U star is uh, the inverse of U. U star and U inverse are the same thing. So this thing about the veil quantization is very important. And not only that, but this U can be uh, pulled from the symbol in a sort of canonical way. Uh, and I won't have time to, to go into this, but this comes from something that is called a metaplectic group. So this is somehow connected with the... So, uh, so you, you, in a sense that it, it comes in a, in a canonical way, way from, from high. So from your symplectic map, which is just a linear map, but it keeps the symplectic form unchanged. From this linear map, you can find in a sort of canonical way a unitary operator on L2. And this will hold. And the trick about this U is, uh, in a sense, uh, uniquely determined by high, in a sense, I'm saying, because it's not exactly uniquely determined. It's, uh, there is an ambiguity, and the ambiguity is exactly of modulus, a complex number of modulus 1. Or a complex module, uh, or just a plus or minus 1. It depends how you define your things. So I won't go into details, but the trick is that this U in a sort of, in a certain sense, uniquely determined by your symplectic form, by your symplectic map. And this property about the valve quantization is very important. And uh, the valve the valve quantization has this property, and that's why it's interesting. The first, of course, the first interesting thing is that the, the formal self adjointness But the other thing is this thing here. Uh, I think that sometimes this is called the metaplectic covariance of the valve calculus. It's called like that. Okay. So uh, now, uh, how much time do I have? Uh -huh, I have time. Right. Okay. So now, uh, everything that I said up until now, uh, A can be totally arbitrary distribution on R to N, right? I mean, I did nothing there. I just take Fourier transforms and did composition with linear maps. Right? There, there is nothing. There is nothing special about what I did here. So A can be arbitrary temporary distribution. Now the interesting thing becomes comes is what do I have to impose on A on my symbol? So this quantization map becomes continuous on S. Because if well, well, because as I saw show you before, if A is a totally arbitrary element in S prime, then your operator is always continuous only from S into S prime. And not just that it's only only continues from S into S prime, but this is an isomorphism. That S prime symbols in... Actually, uh -huh, let me write it again. So this thing is an isomorphism. Again. The 
symbols and then operators. So this means that you have to impose conditions. You cannot not impose conditions because if you don't impose conditions, then everything, every map from S into S prime can be generated by A, and not all maps, of course, are continuous from S into S. So you have to impose conditions, and now the conditions that you impose on A generate calculi, symbolic calculi. As now people realized this very early uh, and started to impose all kinds of different conditions on the A's and generate all kinds of different symbolic calculus. So now I'll show you two or three, which are somehow standard, you probably already encountered. If you're not, you'll see them now. I'll start with probably the easiest. Easiest in a sense is, I don't know if it's easiest, but yeah. Most popular. Yeah, for me at least the easiest, and this is the Shubin calculus. So the restrictions that are imposed on the symbols are the following. So uh, let me fix a number first. A row, a fixed number between 0 and 1. And new any real number. And I denote by gamma m, not m, mu, rho, r to n. This will be my symbol class. So this will be a subset of S prime, r to n. So the operators will be continuous from S into S prime, but in fact it will continue from S. Uh, and this consists of all smooth functions. So A belongs to this. If A is smooth, And it satisfies these estimates for the derivatives. So dx beta, d alpha x, up xi of a to the power m with a constant, of course, here. Mu, mu. Uh, just quickly, this is the bracket, uh, what I'm using here, I think it's usually referred to as the Japanese bracket, you probably all know it, but let me be consistent and write it, so it doesn't matter for any x, this is to the power of one half. Uh, okay, so your symbols have a fixed growth, mu. Uh, incidentally, mu can be negative. And every time you take a derivative, you gain order. You gain growth. I mean, not growth, but you gain decay. So the more the derivatives you take, the faster the symbol will decay. And as it turns out, if you... Uh, incidentally, uh, as I define the space like this, because the symbols are always polynomially bounded, they are, of course, subsets of S prime, right? I mean, it's obvious, because they are polynomially bounded. But the trick is that if you take the value, not just the value quantization, but any quantization of this thing, the operators that it generates will be continuous on S. So I don't know if this is, because it's called the Shubin calculus, probably it was developed by Shubin. So if you take any element from this, the while quantization, not just the while, but any quantization, but I would be particularly interested for the while quantization. So the while quantization is in fact continuous from S into S. And not just continuous from S into S, you can extend it uniquely as a continuous map from S prime into S prime. Uh, I, won't do, I won't go into details into the proof, but just briefly, what's the idea? I will do it for the zero quantization because it's easier to talk about uh, when tau is equal to zero, not with the while because it's easier here, but essentially we'll do the same thing for the while quantization as well. So 
so this was my action. What I do, what I will do here is big C. Big C. Uh, uh, yeah, the big C. Exciting. Mm -hmm. What you can do here is you do this thing. So you rewrite this e, uh, this phase e to the power i x psi as follows. Well, I'll let me write it like this: i minus delta. Delta here is the Laplacian. Now I want it with respect to because I want to transfer everything there. I probably want it with respect to psi will be 1 plus x squared. And if I take it to a power k here, this will be to the power k. Right? Because when I take this thing of the, of the face, you'll get exactly this thing times e to the power x psi, the, the same thing. And then this face, uh, you divide with this thing. Uh, because the integral is with respect to psi. Aha, let me write one more step. I want to show you this, why it works, why this thing is the thing that will make it work. So, plug inside, we get E, X, Psi, you have 1 plus Psi squared minus K, and then you get the derivatives with respect to psi of this thing, but then I uh, use integration of the parts to switch it from the other side, on the other side, and then you get a x. Oh, sorry, And then you get this division by. And the thing is, then when you take derivatives of this thing, ax xi, you don't go. That's the thing. Because each time I take derivatives of ax xi, I get something that grows a little bit less. So, in a sense, if you do it enough times, you'll get a convergent integral. That's the trick. Uh, that's why uh, this gain of growth is imposed there. Because this gain of growth will eventually, if you take enough derivatives, will make your function to be good enough. Broadly speaking. But that's the idea. Okay, so uh, uh, this is the, sh the Shubit thing. Incidentally, <coughs> Also, you probably also know uh, is the classical uh, S of delta half rules of Hermanda. So this is called S of delta on R to n. These are my symbol classes. Well, this rho and delta are fixed numbers, and now let me not make a mistake. Zero, but they cannot be both one. Delta has to be less than one. Otherwise, the theory won't work. Uh, okay, so uh, this is co this consists of all smooth functions. So A is smooth. And the important thing is you have a similar uh, growth condition, such that every time you take derivative, in a sense, you gain growth. Not growth, but you gain decay, in a certain sense. Aha, let me put this mu here, again. Mu is n real number.
incidentally, notice that when I take derivatives with respect to x, you lose growth, right? Because this is to power minus delta, you get something which grows faster. But anytime you take derivatives with respect to xi, you gain growth. And the trick is that rho is bigger than delta. So in a certain sense, when in, a, in the diagonal, when alpha is equal to beta, you always gain more than you lose. Except in the case where both of them are equal, then you don't gain anything. But, and the trick is, you can do more or less the same thing as I did before, but it's far more trickier for this, to show that this continues. Because it's not really obvious. You have to do something weird. But in any case, in any case it works. That the operators here are also continuous. Notice that this part here, in a certain sense, gives you the, uh, uh, the in, for which is the function which bounds the symbol from above, the start one. And then every time you take derivative, you lower it. This is usually called the order of the pseudo. And here, in the uh, wild in the uh, rho delta calculus, this is just xi to the power mu. Here, the order is given by x xi to the power mu. And now, before I give you the, uh, incidentally, I purposely wrote, uh, wrote uh, I didn't put them up, these things. I purposely wrote them down uh, because I want to, to generalize this in a very global way. I mean, you know, to generalize this in a very, very general way, <laughs> this thing in a moment. Uh, one more thing. And the, uh, the next thing is probably not very familiar, but it will serve me a good purpose. And this is the bill Stefferman calculus. And the classes are this. They are usually denoted by S. And then there is a weight M. So this M is a positive function. And continues. Then there are two weights. I will not use the notation from Bill's FFM, I will use my notation. Because otherwise everything will be messed up. Capital Phi and capital Psi. And these things are also positive. Uh, continuous. Okay, and so now they have a couple of additional conditions. I won't list them all. But I will list two important ones. Phi is bounded from above. Psi is bounded from below. And something additional about the growths. So they cannot have totally arbitrary growths. You can think of them as linear, in a sense. But like, oh, sorry. Psi is linear and phi like one over linear or something like that. And <clears throat> oh, A belongs here. If A is smooth, and uh, A satisfies this condition on the derivatives. And now you somehow recognize why I wrote them these things like this. calculus, this is in the S or delta calculus, this is my M now. Then you have the thing that gains you growth, not gains, gains you decay every time you take derivative. 
So every time you take derivative with respect to beta, you gain growth, right? Your symbol grows a little bit slower. And how much slower? Like this slower, this much. Incidentally, in the Schubin calculus, this phi, so let me write it here, in the Schubin calculus, this phi is x psi to the power of And psi is the same thing. Right? Because uh, when you take derivative in the Schumann calculus, when you take derivative with respect to x, you get a uh, growth of x, x psi to the power rho beta. You get, when you take derivative with respect to psi, you get a growth x psi to the, the same x psi to the power of the derivative. Right? In the rho delta calculus, here, Phi of x psi is x psi to the power minus delta. Psi of x psi is x psi to the power rho. Right? Because, I mean, that, that's why I wrote it like this. So this is my phi, this is my psi. Incidentally, notice that in the Schumann calculus, as I wrote it here, this thing do not satisfy this condition of P less Fermi. Because this, in fact, I'm going to assume that phi is always less than c, and psi is bigger than c, and here it's not, obviously. But the trick about them was that they actually wanted to generalize this thing. They didn't care about this, the Schumann calculus. So they didn't even bother to, to consider what happens. No, no, it's that simple, because the important thing was to generalize this thing. So that why, that's why they didn't, they imposed. Uh, but otherwise, their, their theory will work if both phi and psi are bigger than zero. And it actually, it's easier then. Not zero, but bigger than a constant. The, the theory, if one goes to the, to the paper, everything works fine and it's even easier. But they didn't care about this thing. They, they were interested about generalizing this thing. OK. So now, aha. Uh -huh. So now, now it's my, <coughs> my uh, the, uh, what's, what's the name of the, 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 the kick now, the final punch that will generate them, generalize everything. So from under did was that he noticed that this thing, because he was, uh, you can actually read this about in, in his paper, he actually comments about this, that he recognized that this thing is actually norming the derivative, and I'm talking about the derivative, not, not the, uh, the derivative, so that the multilinear map, because you know the derivative is a multilinear map, that this thing is actually norming the derivative with respect to a very special kind of metric. And how, how he did that, how did he did this thing, how can we recognize it? I don't know. I mean, that's why he's from under there. I mean, I mean, when somebody tells you about this, then you can say, ah, yeah. But that jump of, yeah. OK, so let me uh, do this now. And then we'll, after the break, we'll, I will continue with the calculus. So let me, re uh, let me first rewrite this thing like this. This is the thing on the left-hand side. I won't care about the, the m. So assume that m is 1. If you take supremum when alpha plus beta is less than k, and then you take supremum over all k. I mean, for each k, you have one seminar. OK. OK. So now let me recall something that you probably all know. But if you have a function, just 
F general, something general, very general. If I have a smooth function, it doesn't matter where it is, I will purposely put it to on R2N, because my A is on R2N. Then my key derivative at X is a K linear, is K multilinear map. For, so for each X, you have a K multilinear map. With values C, right? Because the, the first derivative is the linear map, the second one will be a bilinear map, and la la la. The k derivative is k multilinear map, and it's totally symmetric. And in fact, it is given like this, and now I'll have to use my cheat sheets. I hopefully didn't mess it up when I was calculating yesterday, yes. because this was like at 12 o'clock in the, on, in the night. Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you do the thing, you calculate everything, la la la, this thing is exactly this. derivative, which are numbers, and then, 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 I have sum over sigma, where sigma is a permutation of k elements, where uh, the first alpha 1 appear are the same, the second alpha 2 are the same, and so on. So it's a permutation with repetitions of the elementary Tensors. Uh, let me put it. I know this is geometrically very bad, and I'm feeling very bad about putting it down. But I'll put it down. No, no, it's good geometrically to put it down. No, no, it's bad. It's bad, but I'll keep it down. So uh, when when I eva this thing this thing is a multilinear map on R to n k times. When you evaluate the vectors, vector t and la la la, so on. The first one, so each vector you put it on on each place, and each this each of these vectors, so b x one from the vector t picks the first coordinate. Of t and so on. Okay, so this is the derivative, and this is a post multilinear map because you have your coefficients and then you have your elementary factors. Okay, and now I will rewrite this uh, one more time like this. Well, this dx alpha is the symmetrized product of these things. So this is the symmetrized uh, elementary tensors. Okay, yeah, so now the thing is, Now, x is fixed, it's God given, it's fixed, nobody changes. I take a very special inner product on, on, on R2n, and my special inner product is the following. I'll denote it by g, x, x is fixed. Uh, this is capital X, so this is an R2n. I define very special inner product of T1 and T2. So, these are T1 prime. T1 double prime, T2 prime, T2 double prime. I define very special in the product, and in the product is the following. T1 prime, T2 prime, this is the ordinary inner product on R2n, but I divide it 
by phi of x squared. This is the phi of x in the Bill's Ferman calculus. Plus c t1 double prime. C2 double prime. My notation is horrible and I will mess it up, but I will be careful. Uh, psi of capital X squared. And this is an inner product. So x is fixed. Nobody touches the x. It's fixed. I'll define this in the product. And now what I do is the following. I'm interested in the norm of this multilinear map with respect to that inner product. So what I'm here, what I'm here now is what's the norm of fkx as a multilinear map, blah, 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 but with respect to this inner product. So just to recall, this is the supremum by definition. This is the supremum of my inner product uh, till, aha, I'll, I'll denote gx of t to be gx tt. So this is the norm squared of t. So by definition, this is this. This thing here, what you get is exactly this thing. I mean, th th this is not exactly that, but it's bounded by that thing from above and below the constant. Aha. Uh, okay, so let me do this very quickly. From uh, why this thing is smaller than this. Okay, so when L alpha and beta are fixed, are fixed such that alpha plus beta is k, what I will do is I will substitute in this form the vectors t1 to tk, the total in number alpha plus beta such that, so I want to have all ones here, right? So I'll substitute such that t1 to t alpha 1 is 1. t, okay, so the vectors I will substitute are t1 up to t alpha 1 are exactly this 1, 0, 0, 0, la, 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 and then 0, 0, 0 in the last coordinates. Then starting from t alpha 1 plus 1 up to t alpha 1 plus alpha 2, the, what, what you have one in the second place, and so on. And when you substitute this thing here, this becomes one, and you have the, just the derivative of, of f. So this means that each of these factors is less than this thing, but we have to be careful about the norm of these things. Because I ha you have to take the supremum, uh, you have to take the supremum when the, these vectors have norm less than 1, and these vectors do not have a norm less than 1 with respect to this norm. Because when you take the norm of, of 1 here, it will be 1 over 5 squared. So in order to make that to be 1, I'll multiply and divide with 5. So instead of this, I will take... I'll finish it very, very soon. Instead of this, you take the vectors 1 over 5 times La, la, la. Then 1 over 5 for this. And then for the for the psi ones, you take 1 over psi. And so on. And then the trick is that these vectors have exactly no 1 with respect to this norm. Right? Because if you take 1 here, and 1, you have 1 times 1. Uh, no. Maybe I should put it a 5. <clears throat> Not one over five, but five times that, right? Uh, yeah, I think five, five times that, because when when this is five times.
times one, and then you have five times one, the five will cancel, and then we have not one. So not one over five, but five. And sine, so on. Mm -hmm. And then, when you substitute that thing, they will have known one. But when you substitute here for the for the, uh, the k differential, what you get, you get in front of exactly alpha times uh, you have. So you substitute here, and you have exactly phi to the power alpha because you have alpha times phi that appears, and psi to the power beta. So this means that if you reach alpha and beta times this is exactly, not exactly, but it's less than, than this norm. Because if I can find t1 to tk such that when I substitute in the, we all with a norm less than 1, when I substitute into the multilinear form, I get this quantity. And in order to show the other way around, the other inequality, you have to use some kind of a cauchy schwarz thing. So you can, you can show that this thing is, I show that this thing is bigger than that, and to show that this thing is less than that, you have to use some kind of a cauchy schwarz And if you're interested, I'll write it down after the break. But the thing is that the, the upshot is that, uh, incidentally, it's not exactly that, but it's a constant times that. The upshot is that this quantity here is more or less sort of equal to not F, but A, capital X. But normed in this space LK, where the norm here is GX. That this GX is defined like this. That's the upshot. And now uh, I think we have to have a break, but the, the upshot now is that I can take something else for G now. My inner product doesn't have to be like this. Now the idea is you take an arbitrary inner product, which varies from point to point, and you define your symbol class by this. And this is Hermander's idea. So now my, my simple class will be, forget about this thing, my, my a's are exactly the smooth functions. You, first you fix your g, and my symbols are exactly the smooth functions for which these are bounded in this sphere. Uh, I think we should have a break. Okay, so it's... Ah, yes, qu questions, uh, yes. Yes, maybe some few questions. Of course, there will be second lecture, so... Uh, so we have some specialists in SMG calculus maybe here. I, I told him that he should uh, repeat this part. <laughs> the last part again. The last two. <laughs> okay, two. Yes, okay, maybe. Yes, sure. Maybe a couple of comments. Uh, Sorry, yes. Comments, mm -hmm. questions, if you don't mind. So, first, regarding this AK, maybe it's worth mentioning that these are nothing else but the K terms in the multivariate Taylor expansion of the function, which is something you taught in lower division kind of calculus classes, should be more or less familiar to everyone. And so I guess there is we're probably also missing some tutorials in the denominator, but that's that's not very important. Uh, so then it becomes I'm kind of more familiar. Uh, with yes, yes. Uh, in the sense that yes, it's uh, yeah. That, yeah that, that, that is like, that is the Taylor expansion, but that's yeah. Yeah. Okay. Two t five t one and t k. Tom, so on the left side, f k of x u prime to t one t k. There is no such thing. No, I think that this formula is okay. But this you have, uh, on I don't have this here. No, no, but I don't have this here. This but is you just put the x. Uh -huh. so no, no. When you apply, no, no, this, this uh -huh. is just a so multilinear map. The, this formula is uh, so okay. So this formula is really okay. <laughs> the, maybe I messed with the factorials here, but yeah. yeah but this formula is really okay. Uh, it's another. exactly that. So it's exactly the derivatives times this uh, sum of over the uh, symmetric group when you have these repetitions. More general comment, if you don't mind. Uh, well, it seems like uh, generally mathematicians have a tendency to uh, to ignore the elephant in the room when they are talking about uh, 
microlocal analysis and quantization in the physics. So maybe it's worth mentioning why, say, the self-adjointness of the wild quantized real symbol is self-adjoint, why it is important, because the real uh, symbols, they represent the real observables in classical mechanics, and then on the quantum mechanical side, we have to have permission operators so that their spectrum is real, and why simple ectomorphisms or spin tactic maps are then realized as unitary maps because these are the canonical transformations in classical mechanics and those become classical transformations, the canonical transformations in quantum mechanics. So uh, these things maybe are useful to mention. Yes, so yeah, uh, th thank you. Uh, I was trying to mention this thing when I wrote the, the metaplectic covariance, but I honestly forgot. It. So, the, so the important thing was, okay, yeah. So the metaplectic covariance again, this from a physical point of view, as far as I know, you'll correct me now about this, but from a physical point of view, this is important because your uh, symbols, when you quantize them, these canonical transformations, which are called them symplectic transformations, you have to represent them on an operator uh, kind of level as uh, uh, unitary operators. So this, uh, this transformation in phase space, you have to transform it, represent it as a uh, self adjoint operator in L2. On your uh, space of what, I don't know how do you call them, this, the, yeah. The, yeah, the inverse space. Yeah. yeah. So, and that's why this is important. And uh, probably this is the more important thing about the well quantization because it somehow plays nice with this sure. uh, symplectic uh, structure and the unitary group. Right, so it, it makes the quantization procedure somehow categorical. Yes, Th those are the correct parts. Thank you. <laughs> this is the correct way to, to phrase it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, very good. I think that we are a little bit over time, so I suggest we... Uh, we, we make the break shorter, maybe 10 minutes. Yes. And, and we also make the second lecture shorter. Uh, so then we. Uh, because I think we have a uh, cake break. And. Uh, okay. Cakes are getting warm. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so let, let's have 10 minutes break now. I have to go and smoke a cigar and uh, we can continue. <laughs> have a cigar.